Hello, one and all. Welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. The Long Road to Nowhere. Who is the old leather man of Connecticut? I've got no idea. Never heard of the old leather man of Connecticut. To me, leather man is like one of those pocket knives that's got a pair of pliers in it. <laughs> that's just... My wife and I were trying to come up with a, a good idea for a gift for her father for his birthday. And we were like, I don't know. He just... Well, I don't know what to buy him. And no, no offense to my wife, but she always, like... It, she has a sister and her mum and her dad in her family and they always buy the father quite bad gifts like quite gifts that women would buy men like you know what do you get him oh we got him some soap and i'm like men don't want that but i also wasn't sure what to get him so we asked chat gpt and it came with the brilliant suggestion of a leather man based on his like hobbies and interests and i'm like that's incredible that's a great gift idea why are we here we're not here to talk about that no one's here for these tangents let's although maybe you are let's just jump into the story shall we thank you danny for writing it i've never read this before let's go The long, yawning chasm of another dreary school day in the summer of 1885 drifts all too slowly into the late morning. But a welcome tingle of anticipation begins to slowly bubble to the surface in a stuffy old classroom in the shoreline of Branford in New Haven County, Connecticut. If today was a typical day, there would be another full, torturous hour to endure before Miss Hawthorne called the next recess. Oh my god, I just remember being at school and just being like in classes that I found so boring. Like, I just found English, especially like English literature, English language, just so boring. I remember hating those lessons and just sitting there and just being like, it was, we always had double English and that was an hour and 20 minutes. And I just remember looking at the clock and it would just be like, I swear to God, it would be ticking backwards. And it's just like, come on, Belle, come on, Belle, ring, ring, ring. And I just look at my kids nowadays and I'm like, you got to go. Like we have secondary school for seven years and I'm just like, you got to go through like seven years of that. And I'm like, I didn't even hate school. I didn't even not, I didn't, like, school was all right. Like, I didn't mind it. But I'd just be like, if I had to do that again, it'd be so troubling. <laughs> but everyone in the classroom this morning knows that they're going to be briefly given the freedom to run outside and gulp in the fresh air in just 10 minutes. And that's not because Miss Hawthorne is a high functioning al alcoholic who desperately needs to get to the liquor store before the owner shuts early to go fishing. That's just a coincidence. It's because today is Leatherman Day. It's a special occasion which only swings around at a very specific time every 34 days. Weighed down by the heavy patchwork suits stitched together from bits of old leather, the mysterious homeless traveler, known as the Old Leather Man, will briefly wander into view and be greeted like a celebrity as he silently accepts food offerings from the kind-hearted souls that he meets along his path. I, I really assumed, like, Old Leather Man <laughs> is gonna be some dude who, why is he called the Old Leather Man? Ah, oh, because he kills children and uses their skin to make leather and wears it as a coat. That's what I imagined the Old Leather Man was, but it just seems like he's a homeless dude who stitched together actual leather that's kind of nice isn't it that's a nice break from what i thought the old leather man was <laughs> just before we continue today's video have you ever found yourself stressing out over your online security or ever worry that your online secrets your passwords your banking information is getting into the wrong hands well fret no more because surfshark today's sponsor has your back surfshark is the superhero that your internet needs to keep your internet plan safe and sound no more worries about who's lurking in those digital shadows. And the best part, using Surfshark is easy as a Sunday morning. Seriously, even your grandma could navigate it. One click and you are surfing those virtual waves securely. Plus, who says it had to break the bank? With Surfshark, you get all of these fancy VPN perks without a hefty price tag. Your pockets will thank you. And for you travelers out there, Surfshark ensures you get a slice of home wherever you are, watch your favorite shows, unblock websites, and snag amazing deals no matter where life takes you. And the cherry on top, Surfshark's add-on security combo from Breach Alert to antivirus protection, they've got it all. And for tech enthusiasts, Surfshark boasts 3200 plus servers worldwide, GPS spoofing on Android, and a kill switch for accidental disconnects. And did I mention you could use it on unlimited devices with one subscription? You can use the promo code DTU for an exclusive winter deal, up to six additional months for free. Just go to surfshark.deals forward slash DTU. You don't want to miss it. So level up your internet game with Surfshark. Big shout out to them for sponsoring. And now back to today's video. Including the excited school children. Oh, okay, so he's meeting the excited school children of Branford. Great. Then he will resume his endless journey, a journey which takes him on a long circuit between the Hudson and Connecticut rivers, consisting of 365 miles or 587 kilometers in total, before he loops back again. A journey which some say he took for over 30 years, always passing through each destination as regular as clockwork to mingle with his fans before moving back onto the same well trodden path. But how did a nameless vagabond become quite so famous in life and death and manage to generate quite many local headlines whilst barely speaking a word where exactly was he from and why did he stick so rigidly to a strict timetable on his epic circular trudge through eternity i don't know maybe just because he's a little guy he's got screw loose 
It's like, look, if someone's just walking 365 miles every month for no reason, it's just like, well, you know, they're just, it's, it's, what's going on upstairs, eh? You know? Mystery solved! <laughs> Don't worry, there's 19 more pages left. If his identity was supposed to be such a great mystery, then why did his gravestone marker clearly display his full name for the best part of six decades? The name of a man with a tragic past. And how did Leatherman continue to conjure up even more baffling puzzles to solve from beyond the grave? Well, over a century after his death. Take this opportunity to stretch your legs a bit as we pick up the tale of the old Leatherman of Connecticut and strive to separate the baths of truth from the blind alleys of myth. You'll probably need a pair of proper good boots. Yeah, that's just so much walking. You'd go through so many pairs of shoes. Before we take our first tentative steps into the wilderness, I want to dispel a couple of myths right away. If you're not familiar with the tale, you might be bracing yourself for the anticlimactic revelation that the Leather Man never existed at all, or that even if he did, he was just some bloke called Derek who wore quite a big coat and was once spotted walking past the same tree twice. Yeah, it's not uncommon for decoding the unknown to be like, well, yeah, it turns out the Leather Man is just a. The only confirmed sighting was Derek. And there was nothing more than that, and that's where, that's the end of it. Very disappointing. But the main gist of the story is completely true and well documented. There was indeed a quiet 19th century homeless man dressed in a bizarre outfit who spent years wandering around a sprawling 365 mile circuit with quite staggering precision for unfathomable reasons that he kept to himself. It was speculated in recent times that the Leatherman was a mentally scarred veteran from the American Civil War who had escaped death on the battlefield but had lost his mind due to the fight. Yep, sounds entirely reasonable. That would be my first speculation, other than his name being Derek. But that theory doesn't make an awful lot of sense. As was first spotted in the 1850s, a few years before the American Civil War kicked off in 1861. And Leatherman was a pretty unmistakable figure to spot. He was approximately 5 foot 7, with grey blue eyes and a mop of dark hair, which was usually covered in a hat. His naturally weather beaten and often grimy face offered little clue to his age. You could have understandably assumed from the crags and grooves in his face that he was well into his 60s or 70s, and this seemed to be the general assumption based on his not entirely polite contemporary nickname of the Old Leather Man of Connecticut. Yet yeah, the Old Leather Man does make you sound like a serial killer, mate. But it was difficult to know for sure. Considering the arduous journey and lifestyle he'd, been, he'd undertaken, he had more than a tough paper round to blame for possibly looking old beyond his years. He obviously wasn't the most well-groomed man in the area. In fact, it was often said that you could smell him coming before you actually saw him. But some eyewitnesses have suggested that he was a lot cleaner than you might imagine, and at least spent some time freshening up by rivers and streams, if and he might not have gone so far as to actually take off his signature leather suit. It's gross to shower and just washing in a river in his clothes. It's bad, but homeless people do smell really terrible. I mean, it sounds bad, but they do. Like, I don't, like, if I'm traveling on the tram, and then you're just like, you know, just on the metro or whatever, you're just sitting there, and you're like, you know, oh no, I've accidentally sat near a homeless person. <laughs> it sounds terrible. And obviously, homeless people, they should be provided home homes. Um, obviously, that seems pretty straightforward. But, and showers. And showers. God, I sound like a snob. I'm just trying to say it. it's just, it's, I'm just trying to illustrate that I can imagine what old leather man smells like. And so can you. And of course, it was these distinctive clothes by which most people recognize leather man. He certainly had his own thing going on. His coat, trousers, scarf, hat, and backpack were all sewn together from bits of old leather, and this costume was very much an ongoing project which he would regularly patch up and improve at every opportunity, often accepting handouts of leather scraps and cut-offs from tanneries. The whole bulky suit weighed in at 60 pounds. That's not just a, what is that, like 30 kilos? Hey Siri, how much is 60 pounds in kilograms? 27.2 kilos, that's not, that's, I mean, my guess was not bad, but that's very heavy. And that's not just a guess, it was weighed during a coroner's inquest. And he was clad in head to toe from this stuff, even on the most sweltering of summer's days, as he continued his long and relentless clockwise shuffle across western Connecticut and eastern New York. Oh my god, the sweat that must go into that leather outfit. <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> he passed through no less than 41 towns on his circular route along the Connecticut and Hudson Rivers, covering roughly 10 miles or just 16 kilometers every day, always ensuring that he was in the exact same spot at the exact right moment throughout all 34 days of the long cycle. So, pausing to figure out the maths, he would have completed this whole circle 11 times every year, which means, casting aside the days on which he would have rolled into town on weekends and school holidays, the kids of Branford School would have still enjoyed a fair few Leatherman days and early breaks for recess throughout the year. I'd be like, I love the Leatherman. It'd be like, do you want to stay in English class, or do you want to go outside and see the smelly Leatherman? I'd be like, I want to smell him! Please! <laughs> Anything but this torture. If I have to go through another chapter of Ethan Frome, I'm gonna kill myself. Ethan Frome, oh my god. That was one of the books we had to study. It's so boring. Ethan Frome? Edith Frome? Ethan Frome by Edith Wharton? 
Who gives a shit? And Miss Hawthorne would have had several extra opportunities to sneak off to the liquor store without arousing superstition. <laughs> Suspicion, I mean, not superstition. <laughs> Of course, Leatherman didn't march relentlessly without ever stopping like some kind of hobo zombie. He obviously needed somewhere to kip for the night, but he got all of that sorted and found himself evening lodges for every single stop on his journey. Admittedly, he wasn't ever going to get access to spa facilities, a soup vending machine. Is that something that exists? That's kind of cool. A plush bathrobes, room service, and free Wi-Fi. Nope, he was... It was the 19th century. But he did have access to his own sprawling network of different caves and rock overhangs and makeshift huts scattered all along his route, which provided all the shelter that he needed. Many of the caves are now known as Leatherman Caves and still attract interest today from visitors who are interested in picking up the scent of the 19th century hiker and getting a flavor of how he lived, even if in truth there's not an awful lot to see. I'm surprised nobody has yet thought to at least set up a leather gift shop in one of them. But while such lodgings might seem thoroughly wonderful, one star, Leatherman considered them all to be his home, and he often kept carefully tended little gardens nearby where he'd grow his own produce. As the evening drew in, he'd get a good fire going and cook up whatever he'd grown, foraged, or received from the locals that day, before retiring for a night on a makeshift bed constructed by he from hemlock branches. Isn't hemlock poisonous? And he was pretty well organized, too. Before leaving his dwelling the next morning, he was often observed from afar scraping out the fire pit and setting up fresh firewood, so that when he rolled in again exactly 34 days later, he'd, have, he'd be all set to get down to business with minimal pissing about. Now you might be thinking, if Leatherman was so well known and treated so kindly by locals, why did nobody bother to offer him a proper bed for the night instead of watching the poor guy sculpt back to that night's cave or rock shelter? I imagine they did, he just probably wants to, right? Well, they did, frequently. He just wasn't having any of it. Yeah, that's that's what I thought. I would say that he politely declined, but Leatherman was a man of very few words, speaking largely in grunts and gestures and incomprehensible mumbles. But despite what may be interpreted as a slightly fierce stare, or perhaps it was just general bewilderment of the world around him, he was widely regarded as an amiable soul who meant no harm or offense to anyone. He just didn't want to be indoors. Any offer of accommodation was swiftly refused, even during the most treacherous weather conditions. He very rarely even stepped inside anyone's house at all, and if he did, it was only to quickly accept food offerings before bidding a hasty and somewhat grunty farewell. He had a routine of knocking on doors of specific farmhouses belonging to people that he'd come to trust and who were expecting his arrival. He would make it clear that he was feeling a bit peckish by either pointing to his mouth or occasionally saying the word eat. Whilst he would reluctantly step inside for a moment when invited, he usually just either popped the food in his leather pouch, of course it was a leather pouch, or he'd just wolf it all down on the doorstep before moving on to his next stop to top up on further supplies. One contemporary reporter from the New Haven Evening Register, who had observed this for himself, noted how Leatherman seemed to have the most voracious appetite, writing, Slice after slice of bread disappeared, huge blocks of meat went after them in rapid succession, and the manner in which he consumed his pie and cake reminded me of an expert magician disposing of his car. Well, it's not surprising, is it? He's obviously doing a lot of walking. Like, if you're walking all day, you're going to get real hungry. Like, I've done all-day exercise, like long hiking trips, cycling trips, etc., where you just walk and walk and walk for almost the entire day, and then you sleep. And it's like the amount of calories you burn is insane. Like, the amount of food. You just eat an enormous amount of food and be like, still hungry, let's eat more. <laughs> But there were only three types of gift that he would ever accept as donations – food, tobacco, and scraps of leather. Aside from turning down any offer of a comfy bed for the night, he would also decline clothes, money, and pretty much anything else that couldn't be digested, smoked, or stitched onto his leather suit. The money thing was interesting, as he did very occasionally accept rusty old coins given to him by generous farmers' wives or young children, but there was a twist. The next time Leatherman returned to town, he would give the coins back, all nicely polished and looking brand spanking new. It's not clear if Leatherman was just being playful, or if he had considered the gift to be a short-term loan, or if he thought that he had just been given a job to do, but he clearly didn't feel the need to hang on to money. Yeah, what's he need money for? It's not like he's out there buying anything. He's just like, wearing a leather jacket and eating cake. <laughs> and walking. He doesn't need to buy anything. However, there's been a lot of speculation over how he must have been spending money at some point, following the discovery of records from a local store which provided evidence of what exactly Leatherman was ordering and picking up whenever he passed by. For the record, Leatherman's regular order consisted of one loaf of bread, one can of sardines, one pound of fancy crackers, a pie, two quarts of coffee, one gill of brandy, and a bottle of beer. One gill of brandy? Gill of brandy? I have no idea how much brandy that is. I assume it's a lot. <laughs> Although he's got to carry it with him, doesn't he? Note the fancy crackers. It sounds as if Leatherman had quite expensive tastes for a vagabond. But where did he find money to pay for all of this stuff? What is a fancy cracker? I have no idea what that is. Let's look it up. Fancy cracker. Is that like some sort of... It's like a chocolate biscuit instead of just a regular biscuit? Fancy cracker. Fancy crackers. 
It just looks like a regular ass cracker. These just look like regular crackers. There's nothing fancy about them. Oh, those look quite good. Oh, I'm hungry. It's definitely lunchtime. <laughs> As soon as I finish this episode, I'm going to lunch. But where did he get the money to pay for all of this? Some of the sillier theories suggest that he was actually incredibly rich and stashed away all of his money in pots of gold at a secret spot on his epic route. Every 34 days, he'd reach this spot, discreetly withdraw the cash that they need for the next cycle. Following his death, there were even serious attempts to track down his buried treasure. But I'm not convinced that Leatherman was an eccentric billionaire. Although we don't know for sure, it's quite possible that he did odd jobs for certain people on his route in return for cash. The only problem with that theory is that after he'd been paid for his services, he'd probably just put the money in a washing machine and bring it back on his next visit. Bearing in mind that we only have evidence from a single store, it's perhaps just as likely that Leatherman had struck a deal with this particular store owner to do a few odd jobs in return for items on his shopping list, or perhaps the store owner just had a soft spot for him and gave him the stuff for free. Yeah, it's not like he's asking for a lot. Although, the brand, I don't know how much brandy that was. Let me see. Gill of brandy. Gill of brandy. Gill of brandy. Unit. Gill. A teacup. Measurement. A quarter of a pint. Oh, it's a tiny amount. A quarter of a pint? What is that, like 125 mils? It's like four shots. What are you up to? <laughs> On the whole, it seems that Leatherman didn't have much interest in earning or receiving or spending money. All he ever really asked from anyone was something to shove at his gob, something to shove into his leather suit, or something to shove in his tin pipe. Maybe it's a little surprising how Leatherman managed to become quite so popular during his lifetime. Yes, he was a mysterious figure from nowhere, dressed in strange clothes who had some very unusual habits, but there was an increasingly unsympathetic attitude towards all homeless people at the time, as the local press began to ponder over new ways of dealing them with them with what was supposed to be a growing tramp menace. Some of the proposed methods included asking all decent middle-class citizens to offer passing tramps poisoned food in a bid to slowly and a bid to slowly and slightly kill them off under the guise of kindness. What the f is that a real thing? How have I never heard of that? <laughs> what are we going to do? Oh, gosh. It's like that scene that um, Mitchell and Webb, <laughs> when they're like, uh, it's a British comedy skit show. It's amazing. And there's this one where it's like there's the, the conservative politician or whatever, and he's talking to his aides, and he's very posh. And they're like, Minister, we don't really know what to do. There's, a, there's an increasing uh, problem with homeless people. And he's like, oh, have you, have you considered just killing the poor? <laughs> Holy shit, you actually considered this? What the fuck, America? Oh, and that's a bad miss. If that failed, the press put forward the idea of just shooting homeless people on sight. The past was the worst. Whilst the Connecticut law... <laughs> Can you imagine reading that? Even on, like, Fox News or some shit, be like, yeah, I mean, we could just shoot them all, couldn't we? <laughs> Like, no! While the Connecticut lawmakers didn't agree with employing quite such dramatic measures, they did go ahead and pass the Connecticut Tramp Law of 1879, which demanded the immediate imprisonment of all vagrants living without labor or visible means of support who stroll over the country without lawful occasion. Wait, so people just doing whatever they want? How can you imprison someone? You're supposed to be, aren't you America? Land of the free, home of the good? Aren't you supposed to, it's like, yo! If they just want to do that, let them do that. They're not breaking any laws. Although I guess they made a law that they're breaking. But it does that. That's not freedom. There's never a particularly great time to be a vagrant, but I imagine this period was one of the worst, and you'd think it might create a bit of a problem for someone like Leatherman, who appeared to spend his whole life strolling over the country without lawful occasion. But much like a UK politician during a pandemic, it seems that the laws didn't apply to Leatherman. It's even reported that 10 towns in Connecticut went as far as to pass ordinances which specifically excluded Leatherman from the brutal statewide anti-tramp law. Whilst anyone who spotted him for the first time may have understandably felt a bit perturbed, by the sight of a lonesome figure entirely clad in leather emerging from the woods whilst mumbling nonsensical words to himself, he was seen by locals as a harmless and shy figure who endeared himself to the community. In many ways, <laughs> you'd be like, hey leather man, guy dressed in leather, is that the leather of animals or the skin of children? He'd be like, Animals. Be like, come over here, grab some food. <laughs> You're not that weird. In many ways, he was probably one of the most famous and well-documented characters in the whole region and would likely boast a massive TikTok following if he was roaming the earth today. He was hugely popular with children, whilst it was considered to be something of an honor to own one of the farmhouses at which celebrity Leatherman had chosen to grace with his presence in search of food. And nearly everyone looked forward to Leatherman Day so much so that it probably should have been declared a public holiday. As the clock ticked down to the uncannily accurate time of his celebrated 
arrival. Crowds of fans would line the streets as they waited first for the aroma to hit their noses, then for the distinctive sounds of his creaking leather suit in the distance, before the man himself stumbled slowly into view. And it's only right that the comings and goings of a 19th century anti-socialite should make it to the pages of the local press. The first newspaper reports began to crop up sporadically in the 1850s, but one of the first in-depth profiles of Leatherman emerged in 1870 from the pages of the Burlington Free Press, who preferred to call him the leather-clad man back in those relatively early days of fame. The paper observed how he only seemed to communicate in monosyllables and commented on his fashion sense, noting that he wore an outlandish costume, which consists wholly of leather and is made apparently from strips and remnants of old boots fastened together by means of orc. And twine. <laughs> By the 1880s, Leatherman's movements had become a regular fixture in some local papers as the horoscopes, the comic strips, and the spot the ball competition, and the pull out glossy TV guide. For example, the New Haven Daily Palladium took the time to break the shocking news in 1886 that the Leatherman passed Westwood Tuesday an hour and one half later than usual time. I have no idea what caused such an inexplicable delay, but I can only assume that he was held up in traffic. The media attention obviously meant that Leatherman occasionally had to put up being hounded by the paparazzi. Well, <laughs> this isn't this the 19th century? What paparazzi? Well, not quite, but seven photographs do exist of Leatherman, all of which were taken by Ban Branford artist and amateur photographer James Francis Rogers, who had apparently struck up a sort of friendship with the backtracker idol. It's not clear if Leatherman was entirely happy with the idea. In at least a couple of the photographs, he does seem to be making some kind of attempt to strike a pose for the camera, whilst in others he just comes across as if he's impatiently waiting for James to finish pissing about so that he can get back to his busy day. However, some quarters of the press weren't always quite so gushing in their appraisal of Leatherman. Like, weren't the press like two pages ago calling for vagrants to be poisoned or shot on sight? <laughs> In 1884, the Hartford Current paper opined, Nothing can be more pitiful than to see this poor, miserable, broken-hearted creature wandering around in cold and wet weather without even the common comforts of life, brooding over his terrible sorrow which has cost him his happiness and prosperity. Whoa, whoa. <laughs> It sounds like this journalist is doing something that we call projecting. Treat him kindly, dear reader, wherever you meet him, and lighten his heavy heart with acts and words of kindness. Why do you think he's miserable? Just because he doesn't, like, live a conventional life? Why do you think he's miserable? Meanwhile, the New York Times, which usually adopted a sympathetic stance to the wandering pedestrian, uh, was clearly in a foul mood in 1884 when it published an article that described him as uncouth, repulsive, and wholly inexplicable. I suppose the leather man was bound to get up at least one or two people's noses. And even though the vast majority of his footsteps were planted without incident, there were always going to be a few ruffled feathers along the journey. I mean, it wasn't impossible to get on the wrong side of Leatherman, even if you're just trying to be nice. If you started asking too many personal questions about his background or lifestyle, he'd get visibly, visibly irritated and just walk off in a mini huff. And this even applied to the owners of some of the farmhouses where he may have been frequenting for years. If they ever got a bit too nosy or too pushy with their offers of accommodation, it would be the last time the Leatherman would ever come knocking at their door. It's not like he was being openly hostile or aggressive or anything, but I guess it was just a bit like the 19th century equivalent of being blocked on Twitter. While most of the children loved and respected him, you're always going to bump into the odd little shit here and there, and he was once spotted waving his cane and shouting indecipherable words at a group of ne'er-do-wells who were throwing stones at him for a laugh, but you can't blame him for getting upset about that. He occasionally had slightly more upsetting problems with the grown-ups. In April 1887, the Waterbury Daily American published reports on an incident which took place in the village of Forestville in Bristol, Hartford County. Leatherman had been plodding along on his usual route, I mean, where else would he be, when he was set upon by a small group of drunken idiots who began taunting him. They initially tried to get him to take off his hat and cross himself against his wishes before attempting to force him to drink from their liquor bottle. The paper reckoned that this amounted to assault, although there's no record of Leatherman being physically attacked. You don't have to physically attack someone to assault them. Assault can just be words, can't it? However, several eyewitnesses reported that the incident was enough to drive the shaken old leather man to tears. And the Waterbury Daily American made it very clear that they weren't going to tolerate this crap, rounding off one of their reports with Ill fares the pusillanimous. Oh my lord, what word does that mean? Look up. Pusillanimous. Cowardly. Okay. Ill fares the cowardly rascal who dares harm him and is proven guilty. It's believed that the Leatherman slightly adjusted his route to avoid that stretch of Forestville on further travels. It may not have been the only time that he took a small change in direction to avoid a spot in which he'd previously encountered trouble. But I was surprised, in a way, that this thing wasn't reported more often. If a homeless man in a very strange outfit was undertaking a loop of Rotherham for years, which is where Danny's from, 
uh, I'm pretty sure he would have faced taunts and threats of violence on a daily basis. I often used to get beaten up after making a reckless decision just to nip to the corner shop for a banana milkshake. But such incidents are thankfully rare for the Leatherman. This was partly because he tended to avoid walking along the main roads or through the busier areas of town where strangers might be looking for a fight. And he avoided Rotherham. <laughs> Probably for the best, it's in the north. But as those defiant final words from the Waterbury Daily American indicate, it was also because Leatherman was largely protected by the communities, and only a fool would risk mis messing with the local eccentric. It would also be like rugby tackling Father Christmas and expecting to get away with it. Leatherman may have been a curious little sausage, but in the eyes of the residents of the towns and villages he passed through, he was their curious little sausage, and if you wanted to keep a hold of your kneecaps, you didn't crack this leather. Yet, considering he was probably the most familiar face in the region at the time, it feels a little odd that so little is known about this man who threw up so many answered questions. I mean, one of the reasons that he's so famous, though, uh, is because people don't know stuff about him. If you knew everything about him, you'd be like, oh, yeah, well, it's not that interesting because the mystery has been unveiled. When the mystery is veiled, it gets, it tends, people tend to speculate more, which makes it more interesting, right? It's pretty basic stuff. What was his name? And where did he come from? Why was he dressed from head to toe in leather? Why did he so rarely speak to anyone? How on earth did he manage to survive so many brutal winters and live to a presumably ripe old age? Or maybe he was like 30. He just looked, you know, incredibly old because it was the past and he lived outside. Was he undertaking the same 365 mile circular loop for years on end? How did he arrive at each and every location with such incredible punctuality that some people were said to set their watches by his appearance? And was he a Burger King or a McDonald's kind of man? It was rumored at the time that Leatherman may have originally hailed from Picardy, France. This was based on the fact that whilst he appeared to have a very limited grasp of English, some witnesses claimed to have heard him speaking a little more fluently in French. It's possible that Leatherman wasn't being deliberately incommunicative, it's just that he didn't speak the language of the natives on his new route. But this then throws up more questions on why a man from Picardy would end up trudging relentlessly across the same circuit across western Connecticut and eastern New York for the majority of his life. Again, maybe he's not aware upstairs. I should point out now that we don't have any definitive answers for most of the mysteries surrounding Leatherman. <laughs> like I say, to go to the unknown, generally quite unsatisfactory. But we'll chew over some of the more compelling theories and debunked myths in a little while. In the meantime, we can at least answer one of those questions right now with a reasonable amount of confidence. How did he manage to survive for so long, sleeping rough in the freezing cold? Well, that's because he knew what he was doing. He was a born survivor armed with a pretty impressive set of outdoor skills which were not to be sniffed at. Yes, it also helped he received regular free donations of food from warm-hearted locals throughout his travels, but he was more than capable of looking after himself in the evenings when he was left to fend for himself. He grew his own food, smoked his own fish, fashioned his own tools, tanned his own leather and made his own clothes. While so many other tramps of the era were frequently known to lose fingers or toes to frostbite, Leatherman was happily toasting his digits next to a roaring fire in his caves and shelters. During particularly cold spells, he would also create a makeshift soapstone by heating up a hearth with burning coals which were then swept away before he settled down to sleep on the still warm hearth which now served like the ultimate 19th century electric blanket. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> We're just gonna wait for it to go like warm. Isn't that gonna take a while? Are there gonna be like little hot spots burning you? It may not have been the most comfortable bed in the world, but he was probably warmer than most and borderline on fire. Leatherman even managed to get through the Great Blizzard of '88 without too many problems. Over 400 people lost their lives in one of the most devastating blizzards in American history when it raged across the east coasts of the U.S. and Canada between March the 11th and March the 14th, 1888. But to Leatherman, always wrapped in his ultra insulative suit. It wasn't such a big deal. Aside from a touch of frostbite in his face. Oh my god, that does sound bad though. It's like, why would. Yeah, it was nothing bad. Nothing bad. Just got frostbite on my face. Oh, so that's why you have a hole there now. Like, frostbite is where tissue dies. That's not going to be a good look. But apart from that, the most inconvenient element of the Great Blizzard was the fact that it delayed his schedule by four whole days and therefore quite possibly tilted the whole fragile balance of the universe. <laughs> Not many people would have noticed this uncharacteristic decline in punctuality, though, as most citizens had bolted down the hatches to save their own lives. Nobody was going to be lining the streets to greet Leatherman that week. Yet, while he may have been as tough as old boots, Leatherman was obviously not completely invincible. By early 1889, it was noted by many observers that Leatherman wasn't quite as steady on his feet as he used to be, and he was sporting a nasty sore which was beginning to spread across his face and produce a small cavity in his neck. Uh-oh. 
That doesn't sound good. Is that from the frostbite or is that like cancer or something? He was also beginning to accept invitations to eat meals indoors more frequently, although it was clear he was struggling with the pain of chewing, and he would continue to refuse any offers of a bed for the night or any help in getting medical assistance. A concerned report from the Bristol Herald observed during these darker days, quote, He refuses to stay in any civilized situation. He breaks away and tramps off for the woods and ledges, be these near or far. Death will be his only release, and it is probably not far off. Oh my god, it's <laughs> a grim sentence to read, isn't it? Death will probably be his only release. That's it. That's the only hope he's got. The only hope he's got is death. Some newspapers were calling for dramatic intervention, but interventions with Leatherman usually didn't pan out very well. A year earlier, not long after the Great Blizzard, the Connecticut Humane Society had taken it upon themselves to secure a warrant for his arrest so that he could be given medical treatment against his will. Yo. If someone doesn't want medical treatment, you don't have to give them medical treatment. It's their decision. They had him bundled into a carriage destined for a hospital in Hartford, and during the journey, a disgruntled Leatherman made several unsuccessful attempts to escape the clutches of Connecticut humanity. It's often reported that Leatherman did make his escape from the hospital at the earliest possible opportunity before he'd even been given a medical examination. But that's not true. He actually got an examination and a diagnosis. This was almost a year before he'd fallen visibly ill, and the doctors found Leatherman to be sane, except for an emotional affliction, which was not a strong enough reason to forcibly detain him. Leatherman was swiftly sent back into the wild, and the Connecticut Humane Society had to go and find somebody else to arrest. However, as Leatherman's help declined over the course of the following year, he was destined to make only a few more trips around his long circuit before he finally reached the finishing line. On March the 24th, 1889, a carpenter by the name of Henry Miller was enjoying a Sunday morning walk around the countryside of Mount Pleasant with his unnamed wife. I mean, she probably had a name at the time, but we just don't know it today. Yeah, you know what the craziest thing as well? Like, this is always so... I, it's not depressing. I mean, it's just like the reality of life. Like, it's a little bit nihilistic, I suppose. But it's like, this, th this is probably the only mention in history that this woman got, gets as unnamed wife of man who discovered a body. Oh, I'm assuming it's about to happen. And that's it. That's the only thing that anyone will ever remember her for. That's it. And most people are just entirely forgotten. You'll probably be entirely forgotten. I'll definitely be entirely forgotten. Like, Julius Caesar will eventually be entirely forgotten. Pretty crazy, right? His wife expressed a desire to visit a hut widely known to be frequented by Leatherman situated in Saw Mill Woods on the property of farmer George Dell. And the Sunday morning ramblers were in for an unexpected bonus when they got there. They weren't just going to be pootling around an empty hut. Leatherman himself was at home. Oh, wait a sec. This wasn't going to be much of a meet and greet. Leatherman had been dead for several days. <laughs> it's like they were a pleasant walk around Mount Pleasant until they weren't. According to Carpenter Henry Miller, as we entered the hut, we thought the man was asleep, but a second glance saw that he was dead. His hair and beard were mottled with blood, his face swollen and distorted. Oh my god, did someone kill him? The subsequent coroner's inquest, conducted by George H. Sutton in Sing Sing, New York, concluded that the immediate cause of death was blood poisoning, brought about by cancer of the mouth, which had pretty much destroyed his lower jaw. Leatherman's final days on earth would have been far from pleasant, as he was racked with pain and he would have found it impossible to eat anything. He may have survived decades of living and sleeping in brutal conditions of the great outdoors, and he may have breezed through a great blizzard without too much difficulty, but he was likely brought down in the end by a chronic addiction to chewing tobacco. Chewing tobacco is a nasty habit. Like, just keeping all of that carcinogens just jammed up in your mouth for hours and hours? It's kind of gross. Coroner's inquest yielded a couple more interesting revelations about the life of the leather man. The autopsy had concluded that he was only in his 50s. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, he just looked old. <laughs> Significantly younger than many would have assumed, this means that during the earliest recorded sightings of Leatherman in the 1850s, he would have still been in his sprightly 20s and probably popping down the disco had anyone bothered to invite him. Although Leatherman didn't have too many possessions to his name, whatever that might have been, the coroner also went rifling through his leather pouch and came across various tools, a pipe, a frying pan, and most intriguing of all, a well-thumbed copy of a Roman Catholic prayer book written in French. Ah, so they were right about the French thing. That's interesting. Along with a small crucifix found around Leatherman's neck, this appears to indicate that Leatherman was a deeply religious soul. He was often reported to have turned down any meat offered to him on a Friday, and the prayer book would have seemed to confirm that he was a practicing Roman Catholic. Is ro what's up with meat on a Friday? That's not just a Roman Catholic thing, right? Because we, at school, I went to like a religious school. But I don't know what it was. I don't think what the, I don't even know what Roman Catholic is. What is Roman Catholicism? I know nothing about this. And people are like, Simon, didn't you go to a religious school? And it's like, yeah, but I didn't pay attention. Um, look up. Catholic Church. Oh, it wasn't a Catholic school, definitely not. But we didn't eat we didn't eat meat on Fridays in the refectory. It was always fish. Fish and chips, which was great. I love fish and chips. It's very British. Um 
But yeah, that's that's that fascinating tangent, Simon. Thank you. But more than that, the language of the prayer book would also seem to confirm that he was more familiar with French than English. The farmer George Dell, upon whose land the body of the Leatherman was found, had been one of the few, very few to have identified some of the so-called incomprehensible mumbling as words muttered in French. During testimony given during the coroner's inquest, George Dell revealed, He frequently stopped on my farm for a little over five years last past in a rude structure he made in the woods for a shanty or a hut. He never asked my permission to build the hut on my land, and I didn't object. He never came to my home to beg, nor did I ever give him any food. I had a conversation with him once. I could not hold him long in conversation. I thought he was a Frenchman. I asked him a few words in French, and he answered promptly in French. As we hinted at earlier, it now seems likely that Leatherman wasn't just necessarily being ignorant or purposefully monosyllabic. He could have been a fluent French speaker faced with a challenging language barrier. Sadly, it had been a little too late to get any further answers from the man himself. The death of the Leatherman made the front pages of the local press, but it's reported that hundreds of people came to view the body at the undertaking rooms. His original leather suit was briefly put on display in a nearby cigar store, but was later sold to a carnival sideshow in Coney Island, where it was draped over a life-size dummy of Leatherman for a while before the whole thing was destroyed in a fire in 1928. His body was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave in Sparta Cemetery in Ossining in New York. But the grave wasn't destined to remain unmarked forever. Sixty years later, in 1953, a man by the name of Leroy Foote spearheaded a campaign to have a new grave marker installed which would bear the true name of the Leatherman. Wait, how would we… okay. Leroy Foote knew all about it, you see. He knew the Leatherman's full name was Jules Bourgelet and that he originally hailed from Lyon in France. In fact, it was quite a detailed background story if you'd be interested in hearing it. Sorry, it just occurred to me that I've been completely wasting your time by trying to build up this alleged mystery. It's a mystery which was completely solved by 1953. And yet, there was something not quite right about this Frenchman by the name Jules Bourgelet. And even after all this time, Leatherman still has a few final tricks up his sleeve. In the years following, Leatherman's death. He was the talk of the town, even if he was no longer plodding along the paths. The local press, including the New York Daily News, were printing bizarre stories of treasure seekers who had embarked upon quests to hunt down Leatherman's secret stash of gold in his most widely known caves and huts, only to be scared away by his enraged ghost. Rather more sensible people were doing something a little bit more productive than seeking imaginary treasure guarded by grumpy ghosts. People like Chauncey R. Hotchkiss of Bristol in New Haven, for example. It turns out that during his lifetime, nobody apart from the quiet man himself had ever known the full extent of his circular route. They didn't know the exact date and time that he would be shuffling into their part of town, but they didn't know exactly where he'd been for the previous 34 days. It wasn't until the back end of the 19th century that writer Chauncey L. Hotchkiss began reaching out to as many people as he could find who had ever met the leather man. And after several years, it was Hotchkiss who began became the first person to have mapped out the entire 365 mile route. And it's at this point, Mr. Hotchkiss, that I think, Jesus Christ, <laughs> what is your life? How much time do you have on your hands? <laughs> like, are you just a man of leisure? Like, what's up? You just, what? I, I, I just am slightly gobsmacked by, by the fact that someone would make the effort to do this. Several other researchers followed in the footsteps of Hotchkiss. Okay, really? <laughs> I mean, this is an interesting tale, and it's an interesting, like, I think it's quite an interesting story, but the idea that I'd finish this episode and be so fascinated by it that I'd go make a book about it is a little bit insane. And they tried to find out more about Leatherman, and by the time we get to the 1940s, it was Middlebury writer Leroy Foote and his wife Sarah who had picked up the trail in search of fresh clues. It's fair to say that Leroy and Sarah were pretty big fans of Leatherman, as well as conducting countless interviews with people who had seen and smelled him in the flesh back in the day. They also travelled around the region, giving Leatherman lectures and slideshows depicting the full route that they had personally explored many times, along with images of the most famous caves in which he slept. So what? what how's, how's this work? You're just down, like this is the past, so you're down at the local church or whatever. You know, people being all religious and stuff, and then you go in and up on the bulletin board at the church. There's like, come see our lecture about Leatherman. We walked his trail and took pictures of some caves. Who the f is going to that? I mean, I guess it's the past, so there's much less to do. Like, there's not TikTok to be constantly scrolling. But really? <laughs> Le but Leroy Foote felt troubled by the pauper's grave in Sparta Cemetery in Ossining. During his and Sarah's noble research, they believed they'd uncovered the full background story of Leatherman and felt it was time that some of this was reflected on the blank, nameless grave. In collaboration with the Ossining Historical Society, Leroy Foote overstole the installation of a fancy new tombstone, which bore the following inscription, Final resting place of Jules Bourglet of Lyon, France, the Leatherman, who regularly walked a 365-mile route through Westchester and Connecticut, from the Connecticut River to the Hudson, living in Gage in the years 1858 to 1889. Quite a mouthful, probably needed a good edit. 
That wasn't the only thing wrong with it. It's worth pointing out straight away that Leroy and Sarah Foote weren't being deliberately misleading here. They were enchanted by the legends of Leatherman, and they were acting with the absolute best intentions based on what evidence they had uncovered at the time. They had found an article originally printed in the Waterbury Daily American during Leatherman's lifetime in 1884, which was later used as a source for subsequent obituaries and other publications after his death in 1889. The original article, entitled The Mystery Solved, was written by reporter W. A. Selson, who stressed within the text that every detail of the backstory of the Leatherman was completely true. According to this report, Jules Bourglet of Lyon was a young French woodcarver living in poverty who happened to have fallen in love with Margaret Laurent, the foxy daughter of an incredibly wealthy leather merchant. Jules Bourglet sought Margaret's hand in marriage, but the prospective father-in-law wasn't immediately taken by the idea that his daughter planned to get hitched with some low-life woodcarver who didn't have a pot to piss in. Still, he was a fairly reasonable man, and he agreed to give Jules a shot at working at one of his leather factories to prove his worth. The arrangement worked fine for a while, as love struck Jules worked his way up the leathery ladder and gained increasing responsibility in Mr. Laurent's leather empire. Jules and Margaret even set a day for a wedding. But then, disaster struck. This sounds like a made-up story. I'm like, this sounds like fiction. Some versions of the story tell how Jules invested a fortune of the company's money on new stock just as the price of leather fell by nearly half. Another version tells of how clumsy Jules knocked over a lantern late one evening and ended up burning down the main factory. But either way, the story goes that he practically destroyed the Laurent Leather Empire in the space of a single day, after which Mr. Laurent really got the hump with him and forbade him from ever seeing his daughter Margaret again. Although one variation of the tale suggests that Margaret actually died in the fire. This is all made up. This is all made up. Like, journalists in the past, they'd just make shit up, wouldn't they? It was weird. A broken-hearted Jules Bourgelet completely lost the plot and spent some time in an asylum before he fled to America and became Leatherman, doomed to roam the same loop over and over again as penance for his foolish actions, whilst dressed from head to toe in the substance of his ruin. Now, some might think that that sounds like a tragic true story of ill-fated romance and regret. Others, like Simon, definitely, right here, might think it all sounds like complete bollocks. It does seem to me as if a comic book strip writer was given the task of coming up with an origin story for the superhero Leatherman, which he tried to tie in with scant information available to him, like he spoke a bit of French and he liked to wear leather. And you'd be right to think that it was complete bollocks. The Waterbury Daily American published a retraction the very next day which admitted the whole story wasn't true. They printed several more retractions over the next few days just to make sure that everybody got the message. That didn't stop the story getting recycled by other publications after Leatherman's death, but most of these papers quickly realized their mistake afterward and printed multiple retractions which apologized for the error. The story, story was probably retracted more times than it was published as facts, which is weird. Like mostly nowadays, isn't it like, you know, front page, facts, this, it's true. And then like a day later, bottom of page 17, turns out fact this isn't true. No, it's just not. It's just a tiny little retraction section. <laughs> Unfortunately, whilst an overenthusiastic Leroy Foote had uncovered the original articles, he had failed to unearth any of the retractions and so had assumed that the story was true. Leroy had also maybe become just a little too fixated on the tragic love story angle. Over the years, he and Sarah had written to officials in Lyon asking for more information on Jules Bourget, and they had been told in no uncertain terms that no such person ever existed. But they still clung to the story and believed that it was true, and it wasn't until many years later that Leroy Foote finally admitted that they got it all wrong. But in the meantime, the installation of that 1953 tombstone of lies had led to a long dead end for the Leatherman saga. For decades to follow, the fake story became widely accepted as fact. Leatherman was no longer the subject of speculation or investigation because it was believed that the old mystery had been definitively solved. But one person who wasn't quite convinced was retired Connecticut schoolteacher Dan DeLuca. And 60 years after the erroneous tombstone was erected, he was determined to get rid of it. Now, Dan DeLuca first began researching the Leatherman saga in the 1980s. He'd end up spending the next 25 years conducting perhaps the most comprehensive probe into the life of Leatherman ever undertaken, eventually resulting in the publication of his 2008 book, The Old Leatherman, Historical Accounts of a Connecticut and New York Legend. Now, because we introduced Dan Luca as a retired teacher, this is exactly what I imagine retired teachers with too much time on their hands doing. DeLuca had spent all of his time hooking up with historical societies to unearth vintage newspaper clippings and meticulous examining vast archives of microfilm to try and pick out the tiniest fruitful clues buried deep within the reels. 
Now, before he got too excited, he certainly didn't come up with all the answers, but he did manage to debunk a few long-running myths. It was Deluca who uncovered the multiple press retractions regarding the story of Jules Bourgelet. In fact, he even managed to hunt down internal correspondence between the writer of the original article, W. A. Saleson, and the then editor of the Waterbury Daily American, in which the reporter openly admits that he just made the whole thing up. It also transpired that the idea of ten towns in Connecticut passing ordinances, which officially exempted Leatherman from the Connecticut Tramp Law of 1879, was fake news. Whilst he sounds like this guy's a properly good read, he's like diving deep. Whilst he certainly didn't seem to get pestered by the law, this was nothing to do with any exemptions. He was possibly just considered popular and harmless enough to be allowed to continue living without labor or visible support as he stro strolled all over the country without lawful occasion. But more significantly, Dan Luca also reckons that we may have vastly overestimated the total number of years which Leatherman had been repeatedly venturing across his impressively punctual route. It was often reported in the press at the time that the Leatherman had been going around in circles for the best part of 30 years, while some articles suggested that it was actually a bit longer as it had been taking the same journey between 1852 and his death in 1889. However, Dan DeLuca's investigations have revealed that the earliest documented evidence regarding the Leatherman's famous circular route only stretches to 1883. That's a hell of a difference from, 19, uh, from 1852. Whilst he certainly had been spotted at random local places at random local times long before this, DeLuca believed that it was only for the last six years of his life that he got stuck on the patterns and schedules of his most famous long walk. Still, a long time to be going around in circles, but not quite the three decades that we'd been led to believe. Dan DeLuca had wanted to do something about that darn misleading tombstone. The life of Leatherman had first been honored with an unmarked pauper's grave for well over 60 years, and since then, he'd been honored with a tombstone engraved with the name of a fictitious character. Surely, it was time to do something about that. An opportunity arose in 2010. When Leatherman was originally buried in the Sparta Cemetery in Ossining in 1889, the chosen spot would probably have been considered a fairly quiet place to rest one's bones. But in 2010, Leatherman's grave was now only a few steps away from the bustling Route 9, and there was growing safety concerns over the increasing number of visitors to the grave. The last thing you'd want to do is get mowed down by a car when you were just trying to pay your respects to the inaccurate tombstone of a man who never existed. Apparently, one man had already been recently struck by a car, although he wasn't seriously hurt. The Ossining Historical Society decided that it would be much less risky if the grave was moved to a better spot further up the cemetery hill, as this would cut down on the number of fresh graves that they'd have to dig for all the visitors who weren't paying close enough attention to the road. When Dan DeLuca got wind of this, he persuaded the society to take an opportunity to finally ditch the dodgy tombstone and replace it with a new grave marker that was more fitting. But he also had something else in mind. Whilst they were busy examining the grave anyway, he figured he may as well conduct DNA testing on the buried remains to see if they could shed any new light on the real origins of Leatherman. This wasn't an idea that went down well with everyone. In fact, fellow Leatherman enthusiast North Haven school teacher Don Johnson, no, not that one, was so opposed to the whole idea of exhumation that he launched the website leaveleathermanalone.com in a passionate attempt to stop the grave from being disturbed. I love this. Let's see if Leave Leatherman Alone is still a website. It's probably one of those ones that looks very 2010, isn't it? Leave Leatherman Alone. No, it doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> And no, I don't care enough to look up the, the archived version. Johnson felt that the proposed plans were nothing short of a ruthless invasion of privacy. Across various different public statements, he said, I believe that the Leatherman's DNA is his property, and he went to unimaginable lengths to guard his identity during his life. He's dead. He can't have property. He spent 100,000 miles never telling anybody who he was. That legacy to me should speak to us. Never in his wildest dreams or in his final moments could he have imagined that someday some stranger would be pulling his wisdom teeth from his jaw to force him to talk. Do we want to respect him and memorialize him properly? Then leave him alone. Leave his bones alone. Yeah, I don't know where I fall on this one. I'm kind of like, well, I'd like a solution to the mystery. But also, it does seem a little bit disrespectful, doesn't it? DeLuca also noted the incredible expansion of Route 9 would mean that many of the graves near the road would have to be dug up and moved anyway. That's not what he's saying. <laughs> he's like, yeah, we know we have to move it. I just don't want you pulling his teeth. And he disagreed with Johnson's assertions that Leatherman was an intensely private person, noting, I wouldn't say he was a private person because he depended on people almost every day. Besides, you don't walk around in a 60-pound leather suit if you're trying to be anonymous. He's got a point. Yeah, fair play. <laughs> it's refreshing to see that the debate between Dan DeLuca and Don Johnson never turned nasty. They always shared a strong mutual respect. It's just that they strongly disagreed over the proposal to exhume the body. Johnson claimed to have gathered thousands of signatures demanding that Leatherman should be allowed to rest in peace, but the protest was in vain. Okay. I'm kind of glad that they're going to 
DNA testing because I want to know the answer. Permission was granted to exhume the remains by Westchester County Supreme Court, and the excavation took place over three days in March 2011, overseen by experienced forensic archaeologist Dr. Nicholas Bellatoni. But it appears that Leatherman was still in no mood to talk and in no mood to give up his secrets. All they found buried in the soil was a few rusty old coffin nails. There was no trace whatsoever of the Leatherman's body. Don Johnson was said to be pleased that no remains were found for potential DNA testing, but he didn't take the opportunity to gloat. I bet he was punching the air in the privacy of his own classroom, though. But how could the body have simply vanished without a trace? Does John Johnson really care that much? <laughs> I think uh, this is one thing he's punching the air in his classroom. If I got, if I was in his position, I got like, this email email notification. I'd be like, huh, that's interesting. And now on with the rest of my day. <laughs> The obvious answer that instinctively springs to mind is that Leatherman was a vampire who had done a runner as soon as he had been tipped off by the buffoons from the Arsenings Historical Society were intent on ripping up his bedroom. Other potential answers involve the body getting discarded after looters dug up the grave to find the Leatherman treasure, or that the body was deliberately stolen by grave robbers who were hoping to earn a few dollars from the mad scientist who had just moved into Castle Bloodfang. A rather more mundane answer was provided by Dr. Nicholas Bellatoni, who reckoned that the passage of time and the effect of bustling traffic from the nearby Route 9 had combined to destroy all the hard and soft tissue buried within the cemetery's unusually acidic soil, which would have itself quickly sped up the natural process of decomposition. All that was left of Leatherman had long since disintegrated and become part of the soil. He also believed that a historic road grading project may have scraped away some of the original gravesite. The disappointed archaeologist was of the opinion that the Leatherman was very much having the last laugh. Still, although the DNA testing proposal looked a bit tits up, at least Leatherman was moved to a safer location in the cemetery and given a new grave marker. He was. <laughs> he completely rotted away. Whilst the previous inaccurate tombstone was shifted to the Ossining Historical Society Museum. The rusty coffin nails and some of the soil were placed in a new pine coffin and lowered into the ground during a packed ceremony attended by Dan DeLuca, who placed four rusty old pennies on the casket in tribute. In hoping I'm hoping he doesn't propose another exhumation in sixty years' time to see if Leatherman ever got round to cleaning them up. Don Johnson would go hopping mad. The new grave marker is a granite boulder with a small plaque attached to it. It's not quite as wordy as the previous ever, but it speaks more truthfully of the remains. Well, the remains of the remains. It simply reads, The Leatherman. So, where does that all leave us today? Leatherman certainly hasn't been forgotten. Hikers and historians still enjoy revisiting the original route and exploring some of the more famous caves of which the original backpacker was known to quietly retire in the evenings. The annual Leatherman's Loop Trail, a 10k cross-country race held in Westchester, still attracts over a thousand competitors every year as it celebrates its 35th year. And the man was immortalized in a 1998 B-side from the Seattle grunge plotter's Pearl Jam, which was named after him and contained such insightful lyrics as, Comes out of the caves once a day to be fed. He wasn't known to say much, but thanks for the bread. Shame he's dead. I saw his bed. It's all that left that's left of Leatherman. <laughs> yeah, the lyrical genius of Pearl Jab right there. I think Seattle grunge rivals Nirvana had made a better would have made a better job of the subject matter, although the song would have probably been retitled Leatherman is going to hell and he's taking all your children with him, you useless sacks of shit. Yes, probably. But are we any closer to digging up the whole story? Dan DeLuca concludes the whilst he's comprehensively debunked a few myths. It often feels more like he's just wiped away fake facts rather than come up with any new ones. He's not so much solving mysteries as unsolving them. Whilst we now know that Leatherman certainly wasn't Jules Borlet, we're still none the wiser as to his real identity and his real story, and we'll likely never learn the whole truth. Several other groundless theories have been put forward over the years. It's been suggested he was a French fugitive who committed some heinous crime and then fled the country to go hiding in America. He didn't do a very good job of hiding, did he? He became very famous. While that might explain why he was never keen to discuss his background, it seems a bit unlikely that a fugitive in hiding would walk along the same predictable route for years whilst dressed in a bonkers leather suit. Exactly. It was believed by many for a while that the Leatherman's true identity was French shoemaker Rudolf Mossy, whose wife ran off to America with another lover. A broken-hearted Rudolf swiftly followed in pursuit, only to find that she had gone and died, leaving him to roam around in circles of despair. This is like that people are just guessing. It's like there's no evidence to support this whatsoever. It's just wild guesses. This one's actually a bit weird, because there are multiple accounts of a French guy called Rudolf Mossy who did indeed roam around the same location and ask for food donations while dressed from head to foot in leather. But according to Leroy and Sarah Foote, whilst Rudolph may have been a Leatherman, he wasn't the Leatherman. There's more than one Leatherman? 
<laughs> Super weird. The sources point to Rudolph beginning his travels shortly after the original Leatherman had died. He was also a lot chattier, was known to regularly do odd jobs for cash or meals, and apparently got into occasional brawls which sound nothing like our guy. It's not known for certain whether he ever existed at all, but even if he did, he was more of a copycat or a Leatherman tribute act trying to cash in on the death of the original. The most credible first name that we have to go on for the real Leatherman is Isaac, as this was reportedly the name he gave when he was asked on more than one occasion, although there's not much solid evidence to back that up. And even if somebody comes across his birth certificate one day in the future, I reckon he'll still always be known as Leatherman. But where are we most likely to find his roots? There's a popular assumption that because Leatherman appeared to be more fluent in French than English, he must therefore have hailed from France. But of course, that's not necessarily the case. Dan DeLuca has his own theory, which he freely admits he can't support in any way, but bearing in mind that he studied the story of Leatherman in closer details than anybody in history, I'd be pretty happy to trust his instincts on this for now. DeLuca is of the opinion that Leatherman didn't travel quite as far as we may think to reach Connecticut and New York as he took his first steps in life somewhere in Canada. DeLuca thinks that Leatherman was probably a French-Canadian with Native American ancestry. He may have picked up his Roman Catholic convictions from his French-Canadian parents, but there may also have been a Native American Grandpa knocking around the scene who taught a young Leatherman all of the survival skills that he would rely on later in life when he set off to explore the big wide world. Very speculative! It's now believed that during Leatherman's earlier wanderings in the 1850s and 1860s, he may have been sighted in Montreal and Vermont, as well as on his more familiar route across the Connecticut and Hudson Rivers. This could potentially have been because he was still returning to his family home during those early years, but these trips home dropped off in later life, possibly following the death of his last family member, and so he settled down into a shorter circuit on which he'd built up a regular supply of food donations from the kind locals. Perhaps the locals got a bit stingier with the freebies as he got closer to Canada, so he cut them off the map altogether after the family dinner for table fell silent. A French-Canadian with Native American heritage might help to explain the intriguing characteristics of a practicing Roman Catholic who also knew how to take care of himself in the wild whilst maintaining impressive herb and vegetable gardens outside his caves. It's all just speculation, of course, but it sounds more plausible than the story about a Frenchman accidentally destroying a leather empire and running away in disgrace. His choice of outfit may have been considered unusual to say the least, and not something that most people would choose to pull out of the wardrobe on a baking hot summer day, but it kept him warm and dry in the winter, and he clearly had no truck with the concept of changing his clothes to suit the seasons or even getting undressed when bathing. This was his outfit for life, and he was sticking to it. Probably rather literally. Oh. <laughs> his outfit is so gross. Can you imagine going to that cigar store and you're like, ah, oh, the smell of tobacco. Wait, what's that smell? <laughs> Why is that disgusting leather jacket in here? It would also have been easy to repair and upgrade along his travels, as he had no problem in regularly sourcing new bits of leather from various tanneries. I suppose he might have just really liked leather. But that still leaves the question of why the Leatherman chose to stick to such a remarkably long circular loop for the last six years of his life, instead of just pricking one or two of his favorite caves and taking some of the weight off his aching feet. And why did he adhere so closely to such a strict schedule that would put Britain's rail service to shame? <laughs> There's not many schedules that don't put Britain's rail service to shame. Uh, maybe he just likes walking. Maybe he just likes walking. Actually, putting Britain's rail service to shame wouldn't be very difficult, but you get what I mean. Yes, exactly. That was my joke. It's terrible. A lingering theory is that because Leatherman appeared to be a devoted Roman Catholic, he was undertaking some kind of dark pilgrimage as penance for his sins. Perhaps the leather suit was actually his best attempt at emulating the robes that the Romans gave to Jesus just before they packed him off for crucifixion. And the reason that he point blank refused any offers of accommodation was because he felt he couldn't be dragged away from the long penance that he was serving. Another theory to throw into the mix is based on the idea that Leatherman may have been suffering from some kind of severe mental disorder or learning difficulties which went with some way to explain his deeply eccentric behavior. But, but I don't really buy that. He was, he was clearly an intelligent and highly skilled man who had his wits about him and was literate enough to regularly peruse a prayer book. The fact that he was able to keep such a tight schedule without even the need for a Casio digital watch seems against the idea that he had some sort of intellectual disability. Yeah, I just think he was a strange dude who really liked walking simple. It's not out of the question that if Leatherman had been alive today, he would have been diagnosed as being somewhere on the autism spectrum, which might explain his desire to stick so rigidly to an ordered and precise routine. Again, we'll never know for sure exactly what was going on inside his head. I feel a bit more attached to the theory that just maybe Leatherman was a free spirit who preferred to live outside the boundaries of society to do his own thing and keep moving every day, minding his own business. Yeah, Danny and I same page. Like He's just a dude who just likes to be in nature and he just wants to walk and not do anything. Like Other than walk, he just wants to be our nature. 
Some people are like that. It's fine. He's often depicted as a homeless man who relied on the kindness of strangers, but he may have just figured out that he wasn't on a bad number here, really. He had no less than 33 different homes to fussily attend to on his later travels, and he was probably a lot warmer in winter than most of the people around him. And as he merrily strolled over the country, without labor or visible support or lawful occasion, he would usually receive the most enthusiastic of welcomes and get treated to regular free gifts of tobacco, pies, and cake. Leatherman Day may only come around once every 34 days with the school children of Brent but the Fanan himself, every day was Leatherman Day. Some might have considered him to be a lost soul in the wilderness, but I'd say quite the opposite. Leatherman always knew exactly where he was going. I agree, I just think Leatherman's out there having a chill time. It's not that big of a deal. He's just the Leatherman. And the nice thing is, his leather isn't made of the skin of children, which I thought when starting this episode it would be. So that's brilliant. What a nice, heartwarming story. Thanks for being here. Leave a review, and I'll see you next time.